I've talked before about how my favourite application of quantum computers is quantum simulation. So I thought I'd make a video about it to explain what it is, why I'm so hyped for it. And also later on in the video I'm going to be running my very own quantum simulation on an IBM quantum computer. I'm going to be using a software development kit called Kiskit, who are in fact sponsoring this video. And what's really cool is this is available to anyone for free to run software on a quantum computer. So more on that later. But first of all, why am I so excited about quantum simulation? Now quantum simulation is a really promising route to discover the technologies of the future by helping us investigate or discover new materials with new physical properties. Now the area of physics that's involved with studying the physical properties of solids and liquids is called condensed matter physics and it's actually what I did my PhD in. But it's interesting, not many people have heard of condensed matter physics before, despite the fact that it's a huge area of research and it's kind of invented the modern world. So a big success story of condensed matter physics was being able to describe and understand the band structure so how semiconductors conduct electricity. That led to a huge amount of technologies like computers, the internet, and also it's kind of the digital revolution, digital cameras, the screen you're watching this on. And we call this the digital age. And that's because the history of humanity, a big part of our story is our ability to find and harness materials and use their physical properties to invent new technology. So what is a material? A material is just a certain configuration of atoms. And there could be configurations of atoms out there with novel physical properties, either their physical properties like their strength or how they interact with light or their magnetic properties or their electronic properties. And so we want to try and search for novel materials because we, we probably haven't found them all yet. So, so let me give you a concrete example. Superconductivity. Superconductivity is a bizarre feature of certain materials. For example, if you take a wire of aluminium and you cool it down to a very low temperature, just 1.75 Kelvin, it will start to superconduct, which means that electrical current can flow through it with zero resistance, literally zero resistance. So you could set up an eddy current, a circulating current in a wire of aluminium that would just keep looping literally forever as long as you keep it cold. Now we already use this technology for superconducting magnets in MRI scanners or in particle accelerators. But the keeping them cold part is a total bummer because that's a really hard thing to do. And so for a long time people have been searching for some material that superconducts at room temperature. That would mean that we could build, say, computers that wouldn't generate any heat at all. And it means we could potentially make them a lot more compact, way more energy efficient, and also a lot quieter. In fact, earlier this year they discovered the very first room temperature superconductor, a material called carbonaceous sulfur hydride, which superconducts at 15 Celsius or 59 Fahrenheit but only if you squeeze it really hard between diamond anvils to 75% the pressure of the center of the earth. So still not quite practical. <laughs> but the point is there could be a material out there that superconducts at room temperature and room pressure. We just haven't discovered it yet. And because we don't have a theory of high temperature superconductivity, searching for that material is currently a bit like alchemy. You just try different combinations of different materials, grind them up, squeeze them together, and see what their properties are. But with a quantum simulator, potentially you could search through all of those different combinations a lot quicker and measure their physical properties in the simulator. So the big picture is we've got the entire periodic table at our disposal, and different combinations of the elements will produce materials with different physical properties. But the number of combinations is huge, essentially infinite. But that's just one aspect. Another aspect is what happens when we bring those materials together, and that's essentially chemistry. And now we're faced with another infinite set of combinations, not just the materials, but then also the combinations of different materials interacting with other materials. But we can use quantum simulation to simulate those interactions as well. So here's an example from chemistry. 
Making fertilizer for agriculture is currently a very energy intensive process and as a consequence it's got a very high carbon footprint. Now if we could somehow improve the catalyst we use to convert molecular nitrogen into a form that plants can use, we could reduce the energy expenditure of this process and actually bacteria somehow do this way more efficiently than our current processes do. This is the catalyst that bacteria use, and we'd really love to understand the quantum physics of this chemical reaction. But our current best techniques running on conventional computers struggle with this, and so it would be brilliant to be able to simulate this on a quantum computer. In fact, researchers at Microsoft calculated that you could simulate this if you had 200 perfect qubits, which practically means you'd need about 200,000 physical qubits depending on how good the qubits are. So that gives us an idea of how many qubits you'd need to have in order to solve a really valuable problem. So I've talked a lot about the potential of quantum simulation in the future, but where do we stand right now in the world today? Well, a big part of this is in the development of quantum computers. Several different companies are developing quantum computers around the world. I also mentioned qubits. Qubits are the fundamental unit of computation in a quantum computer. And in general, all these people are trying to increase the number of qubits in their systems, but also try and increase the quality of those qubits to drive down the error rates of those qubits when they're doing calculations. Now, as of recording this video, Google have got a quantum computer with 72 qubits in it, and IBM have got another one with 65 qubits in it. But apart from quantum computers, there's other techniques as well for quantum simulation, like trapped ion systems, or ultra-cold atoms trapped in optical lattices, and there's a bunch of other techniques too. But wait, what's stopping us from simulating quantum systems on a conventional computer? Can't we just do that? Well, we do, already. The trouble is it gets exponentially more difficult the more quantum particles that are involved, which means that theoretically a quantum simulator will be exponentially faster at solving the laws of quantum physics than a classical computer. But, but in practice, we're actually very good at fudging things using conventional computers. And the exponential only applies if we're solving the laws of quantum physics precisely. And so if you're willing to accept a little in a bit of inaccuracy, you can use some sneaky tricks, otherwise known as statistical methods, to give you pretty good answers pretty quickly. These techniques include Monte Carlo simulations or density functional theory, which can approximately solve the laws of quantum physics for thousands if not millions of atoms depending on the accuracy that you need. And these have actually been successfully used to develop new materials for things like batteries. So in the future the sensible approach for quantum simulators as they develop and mature is to use them alongside these classical techniques in a kind of hybrid approach, a bit like how we already use CPU and GPUs in our, in our normal computers. The real potential for quantum simulators is to solve those problems where the approximate techniques fail. This would be in problems where even a small error in calculating the energy levels of a molecule or an atom leads to big errors in, say, the rate of a chemical reaction, or in superconductors where the whole behavior of the material depends very strongly on the precise interaction between an electron and an atom. So in general, for chemistry simulations, you need one qubit for each electron orbital. So to perfectly simulate hydrogen, you'd need 56 qubits, which Google did in 2016. But in practice, that's an upper limit. You can actually use encodings that decrease that number. In 2017, IBM simulated lithium hydride and also beryllium hydride. And in 2019, IonQ managed to simulate water using a trapped ion system. Okay, so now time to run an actual quantum simulation. So I'm currently connected to a quantum computer at IBM. And in this simulation, what I'm trying to do is find the natural configuration of a lithium hydride molecule. So the distance between the lithium atom and a hydrogen atom in that molecule. So the lowest energy state of the atom. So here I'm plotting the results. The orange points are from the quantum simulation compared to the exact solution. And it's got the right answer. The lowest energy is the correct distance between the atoms at 1.5 angstroms. So this is a pretty simple simulation, but the fact that I'm running it on an actual quantum computer is pretty cool. 
But what's really cool about this is that it's open to the public. So any of you could write some code and access IBM's quantum computers as well, which I think is amazing. Um, this is using a software library called Kiskit, and I learned how to use it using Kiskit's YouTube channel, which I've got a bunch of really good tutorials on many different aspects, not just quantum simulation, but some famous quantum algorithms like um, Shaw's algorithm, Grover's algorithm, and some quantum machine learning stuff. And I think this is cool because a bunch of people have asked me over the years like how to get into quantum computing or how to learn quantum physics. And I think this is a really good way of going about it because it gives you a motivation to learn about those features of quantum physics like superposition and entanglement by actually getting in and getting your hands dirty. So I've linked to the YouTube channel in the description below so make sure you go check that out. And you can learn also how to run a quantum simulation from your kitchen. <laughs> So the question is, how long is it going to be until there's a quantum computer that's good enough to actually solve some of these real-world problems? Well, here are the best universal quantum computers that exist in the world today. Now, IBM have released their roadmap for the next few years on what they hope to produce over a thousand qubits in a system by 2023. And both Google and IBM have said that they want to produce a system with over a million qubits by 2030. So over the next 10 years, that's a huge amount of development. And by then, that's likely that they'll be in a realm where they can actually solve some problems that are useful that you can't solve on, on classical computers. Now, like I said before, just the qubit count is only one side of the equation. Also, improving the quality of the qubits is very, very important for them to work at scale. Um, but there are some skeptics and there are some significant problems that still need to be overcome. For example, routing the wiring to be able to address a million qubits is currently a problem no one knows how to solve. You can't physically fit a million microwave lines down into their dilution refrigerators. So that's a problem that they need to solve. These also assume that we can implement quantum error correction at scale, which is something that we works in theory, but we haven't actually done in practice. And there's some uncertainty about how effective it will be. So there are still some open questions and you'll find skeptics out there. But personally, I feel like we've seen enough track record over the last few years to be, to be optimistic. And of course, we don't know how difficult it will be to scale up these systems, but there's only one way to find out, which is to actually throw some resources at them and try and build them. And we know that if we can make large scale quantum computers, there are some real practical real world problems that they'll help to solve. So I think it's worth the investment and I'm very excited to see what happens over the next 10 years. All right, well, that's all I wanted to say about quantum simulation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you have a good holidays. I'll be taking a little bit of a break to fill up my brain with, with, with new science facts. <laughs> and I'll be back in the new year with some more videos. So I'll see you then.